Welcome to Zoom O'Clock with your host, Tessie Anthony de Nassau. This podcast brings you enlightening discussions with leading experts and public figures directly to your ears. Good afternoon, Rosie. Good afternoon, Tessie. How are you, my darling? I'm really happily very well and healthy. Thank you for asking. And are you all right? Yes, yes. Gabriel Noir and I are so well. We are, we are obviously also in lockdown, but we will get to that a little bit later. But we're doing well. Thank you so much. We're just missing you and everyone else in London a lot. Something to look forward to, a happy reunion. Absolutely, 100%. So um, for the people who do not know Rosie yet, Rosie is a very, very dear family friend, has really been one of my strong rocks in the sea at all times. We're very close and I feel very privileged to have you as a friend. Rosie is um, the daughter of the late uh, cousin of Her Majesty the Queen, uh, who sadly passed away, but I had the real privilege to meet your beautiful mom uh, and it was just such a beautiful experience to be with her. So thank you for that as well, to include me in such family environments. Um, and uh, then Rosie, what she does for a living is pretty spectacular. Rosie has inspired me since day one, hearing all of her adventure stories, because Rosie is a real life adventurer. Rosie is a North and South Polo ex Polar Explorer, and she has the world record for the North Pole. Then, of course, she has a lot of other merits to herself, but I do not want to give it all away. I want Rosie to tell us all about her life, her story, how she became an explorer, how it is to be an explorer, what are some of the stories she experienced, which are just mind-blowing, and much, much more. So, Rosie, if you want, would you tell us a little bit more about yourself, please? Well, clearly, I'm a perfectly ordinary person who just set her cap at some extraordinary goals and dreams. And um, I, I have realized many of them just by dint of stubbornness, I think, more than anything else. But I suppose I like to think that anything that I have achieved um, in some small way inspires other people because they can look at me and they think well heavens if she can do it then so could I and indeed there's nothing that I haven't done that anyone else couldn't do and I, I think it's just all about having the secret ingredients of passion and belief and commitment and I see that in a lot of the people that you have interviewed, Tessie, with the most extraordinary achievements that they've realized. It's all because of their passion and commitment to those dreams. Thank you so, so much. It's so beautiful that you mentioned that. Yes, I do think that we all have our passions and it's important for people to get to know them. A lot of people are scared to let them out. And I hope that through these Zoom clocks, by meeting people such as yourself, that people actually are tickled, uh, created curiosity to just be a little bit more adventurous themselves. So um, tell me, Rosie, we're talking about adventure. How did you become an adventurer in the first place? I suppose all the reasons have changed and evolved over the years, but but initially it was it was you used the word tickle, but I was very tickled by the, the idea of leaving imprint in time of contributing towards the making of history that, that was of some importance in some way and held a legacy um, that would last through generations. And so when an opportunity came up to join the first ever all-women's expedition, I seized it. And I think that you have to be ready and tuned in to grab these opportunities. They're around everybody all of the time. It's just a question of whether you see them and whether you have that courage to take the most scary step in any expedition, 
which is the very first one of deciding that you're going to do it. It's a step into the unknown. Oh, 100%. I think uh, being a polar explorer such as you are, I, I, I just don't know if I would ever have that strength. I, I think, you know, because obviously you, you became a polar explorer quite late. You, uh, you, had already, you had already a baby, if I'm not mistaken, when you went off for the first exhibition. No, but I was only just married, <laughs> which doesn't sound very complimentary to my husband. <laughs> Happily, his own background had a bit of very noble uh, polar history to his his grandfather and his family background. So um, the the in laws weren't too disapproving. I was I was allowed to uh, career off on my polar ambitions. <laughs> that is incredible. You know, it doesn't take anything. Um, special you said you didn't think that you would be able to I can't think of anyone more able and I I would I would ask you at the drop of a hat to join me on an expedition because you have all the right qualities and that doesn't have to include that cavalier type courage in the sense that most of the time for instance on my solo North Pole expedition most of the time I was terrified but it's a question of going on despite oh yes absolutely so going with the theme of being terrified then would you like to share some of how did you feel being all alone because that's what you were you were all alone in the north pole and the south pole um with just being surrounded by ice glittering ice um and no one else by side other than a radio uh, walking and, and just fighting the ice because the ice was obviously moving as well and you were losing a lot of miles by just standing because the ice would just catch up on you. And, yeah. you know, the nights and the cold and the food, you know, the calorie intake and everything. Tell us a little bit about the reality and the everyday, lay, the everyday life you had doing an exhibition. Well, it's very interesting because um, a lot of people, and I find in particular women, their first response when they're told what my particular uh, career spec is as a polar explorer, they say, oh, um, don't you get lonely on your own? Um, whereas it tends to be the men who say, oh, I couldn't stand the cold or whatever. But I don't understand. To me, it's, it's an alien thing, this thing about loneliness. Because, I oh, beg your pardon, <laughs> talking about comms. Um, because um, uh, I think it's all part of the adventure, the expedition. If anything, one of the most interesting dimensions of exploration and discovery. Because... When you're on your own, in utter isolation, in this instance, for instance, alone on five million square miles of shifting ice, where every day, every hour, every moment was unpredictable, it really intensifies that isolation in that sort of environment. And I was uh, intrigued and monitored um, how that impacted the mind and how you handled it. And I thought it was fascinating that it, it uh, gave you a lot of advantages because isolation sharpens your senses, all of them. And it's like people in isolation now, today, with the coronavirus are saying, um, goodness, you know, I can, I notice the color of the flowers more. I notice the smell of the flowers more. Um, I hear the birds sing. I seem to be much more aware of that now. Everything becomes much more sharper and in focus because there's less materialistic clutter around you. And also your, your, um, your intuition becomes much more finely tuned. We all have incredible, remarkable powers intuitively but they become dulled in this other reality. It's in isolation. They become very sharp. And it's a very good, I'd say, mission-critical period.
piece of equipment. I just dispense after a while with all the gadgetry and the technology. I didn't need it. I, I was almost like a little animal with its antennae up. I, I, I could sense things. I could, I could smell what weather fronts were coming in. I could feel my body temperature change if there was a hazard immediately ahead or something was about to happen. All these extraordinary things. Wow, that's, that is just incredible. You, you, you mentioned then, um, so d I guess one of the good things about the exhibition was that, you know, you could just reconnect to yourself and um, just experience as well nature in a different way. I think there were also polar bears some distance at some times uh, that you could observe. And um, so how was it at night, for example, when it was dark and you could hear the, the noise? I think because, you know, I, I am scared of the dark. I'm very honest with you. Even during the military, I guess I got, I got scared of the dark after becoming a mother, uh, a bit more, a bit anxious. Um, but how was that for you, you know, being alone, knowing that there could be polar bears, knowing that the ice could, could shift or break, or I don't know what. How, how, how was that for you and the cold? Because you, do you have a heater with you? Because that everything equipment that you had, you need to carry that, right? So I assume it was not very heavy equipment you had, or was it? <laughs> well, it's interesting you talk about dark nights because uh, very briefly, without launching into a, a, a lecture over your Zoom, um, in fact, although you start off, a, say, an Arctic expedition in a sort of twilight zone, which is very intimidating. I have to agree with that. Um, and very cold, of course. As the days go by in the Arctic spring, the sun rises higher and higher until you're in 24 hours daylight. Oh. Nevertheless, uh, night times, inverted commas, were very frightening because um, in a way, you were more handicapped <laughs> in your tent than you were when you're out on the ice where you can move and react very quickly to, say, the ice breaking underneath you. But if the ice chooses to break underneath your tent, which is quite likely, you've got a serious, serious problem. So I used to feather sleep quite a lot, and I used to feel quite indignant, in fact, that one wasn't safe even in one's own sleeping bag at, at night time. And of course, initially, in the first few weeks of an Arctic expedition, it is so cold, minus 50s without the wind, um, even in the minus 60s uh, last time I went, that you can't sleep anyway because your body is trying to keep you warm. So it's shaking so violently and spasming. So you just have to um, make do with what you, you can. Um, and you have to keep your body warm um, through clothes, but also nourishing it with food as much as possible as well. It's a diet as heaven. You can eat, you can eat 10,000 calories a day and still lose weight. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I remember you before going to the, starting the exhibition that you were just eating so much. You know, yeah. We went to Pizza Hut like, and that. everything. <laughs> <laughs> Donuts. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Mars bar every day on the expedition. <laughs> <laughs> Very yummy. Um, so I think the exhibition was, what, eight months, right, at the time? Was it eight months or was it shorter? It was, no, the, well, actual fact, people say, how long was the expedition? I was on the ice for 84 days, mm. which was uh, a record that one shouldn't really be proud of, <laughs> longest ever, I think. Mm. But the real whole length of the expedition is is a good two years because of all the um, – preparations that take place that everyone forgets about the less glamorous aspects of it so going over then to the preparation because i know you are planning a new exhibition mm. 
Uh, can you tell us a little bit about it and also the training? When people Google you, so guys, Google Rosie, you see her pulling all of these truck wheels and the videos you're doing, like I just <laughs> love watching them because you are, when I see you as glamorous at, at dinners, for example, or we are hanging out, you're just so beautiful in your dress and very feminine. But when I see you pull that truck wheel, I'm like, whoa, this is, you're like the embodiment of woman in STEM science, technology, engineering, and math, because all of these, you need to master them in order to survive. And at the same time, you use your own body as a living research machine for universities, because I know as well that you partner with universities to kind of like take your vitals. How, do body, how does your body react? Also the feminine body, the, the female body, and all of these other things. So uh, I think the world can be grateful to your research and what you have been given already. So tell us about your new exhibition, though. What are we to expect? And maybe if I can join one day, who knows? Oh, wouldn't that be wonderful? Well, um, one of the big expeditions planned was to cross the length of the Taklam Khan expedition, but clearly because of a combination of um, the virus, um, because the Taklam Khan is in China, Mm. Um, but of also the, the politics in that particular region where um, it's turbulent, to put it mildly. So we have to wait till those two forces abate. So we're not going to sit idly around. So the next immediate expedition <clears throat> is to cross a new desert, sadly, tragically new, because it was a, a sea, the Aral Sea in Kazakhstan. And it has become a desert uh, by dint of the fact that the uh, sea was drained since the 50s and then more obviously since the 60s when it all accelerated, um, drained uh, by the Russians to nourish the uh, cotton industry. Uh, and I'm certainly not pointing any fingers here because we all were wanting fashion and we wanted it then and now and immediately and all the rest and lots of it. So um, there is now only some 10% left of the sea in the Aral Kum, Kum means desert. Efforts are being made to restore um, various like puddles of the sea. There's the, the large Aral, there's the small Aral, etc. And uh, it, the, the desert now straddles Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan. And the expedition uh, will be crossing the full width from the Kazakhstan side, from the west to the east. And as we go, we're not going to be judgmental or critical, but we're merely going to observe and log not just the physiological aspect of the rigors of such an expedition, but also on what is happening to the erstwhile ocean bed, where there might be new plantations, what's happening to the irrigation, what's happening to the pollution, because it's now a highly toxic area with high level of salination mm. and uh, some of the, the chemicals. Uh, that had been used in the pesticides, etc., for protecting the cotton crops. So as soon as as soon as we're allowed to restrictions lift, we'll be there in our starting boxes, pulling our own carts, expedition carts, and it's an all women expedition. So there okay. we go. That's Watch exactly. this space. <laughs> yes, exactly. Keep me posted if I can. I join. Um, so. Uh, so for the people listening here, researchers, or even people that like to sponsor your, your trip or some equipment or just want to be part in some way, please do get in touch with Rosie. I will make sure I put your website below as well and your Thank you. information because I think it's so important that you, you're not only showing the beauty of the world in a, such a raw cut but at the same time, you bring vital research that we all need on the human body, on nature, on irrigation, on the environment, on climate change. Uh, yes. so I think there's so many angles people can support you and can help you sponsor this as, as part of a research project. So I will make yes. sure 
I give it a shout, a big shout to everyone I know. And um, our time has passed, sadly. I could talk to you forever and I will definitely talk to you offline a little bit more after this. So um, one last question to you, Rosie. In times of lockdown, what, what would you like to share with the people listening to this recording right now? Or even in times of not lockdown anymore when people listen to it later? Is there a philosophy of life, a quote, or just something you want to share to help people maybe discover their passions? What, you know, whatever it is, something from you to them as a gift. Yes, I'd like to give, I'd like to give two gifts if it's not um, greedy giving. <laughs> One of which is to say, um, be an explorer. Now's your opportunity. The, the, there's a, hideous aspect of all of this which is the virus itself and what it's doing but in your own immediate situation this is this is an opportunity to be an explorer yourself um, it's a whole new area that you're in you can push out your boundaries you can shake off what used to be your old routines try new things out look after yourself physically and psychologically and you will find that you're spiritually being nourished at the same time and embrace the still don't fill it with lots of 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 calls and online parties and things just just be still and and a great mutual friend of ours always says be still and listen to the soul speak the second thing i'd like to give to everybody is something that my father left with me in a way and I've taken his words with me across the ice and that was he was a prisoner of war in Burma underneath the Japanese in the war and he was one of the few to survive and of course like all his contemporaries he wouldn't talk to me about it but when I asked him once, he did give me a couple of answers, one of which I said, what do you think equipped you to survive where others didn't? And he barked at me, the two R's, of course. And I said, R's? What do you mean? Routine and religion. Mm. And that is what I've taken with me in many situations in life, not just the, the expeditions. And it is something that one can apply now. The discipline of routine on your otherwise suddenly blank canvas but also your religion whatever it is and however you interpret your sense of religion we all have something that we believe and hold on to spiritually and that gives you a flexible strength around it so explore your day and adhere to the two R's rule. <laughs> oh, how beautiful. Thank you so, so much, Rosie. I speak to you after this recording, so don't leave yet. But for now, for the recording, that will be it for now. This was amazing and inspiring and just wonderful. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Tessie. <laughs>